from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Leon Shosher. Welcome. The Library of Congress will be filming today's program for later web broadcasts. Please note that microphones will be available for question and answer for the question and answer portion of the program. Also note that remarks made today within the program do not reflect the Library of Congress. Our first speaker on the program today was to be the president of the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, Mr. Charles Verrill. Mr. Verrill, at the last moment today, found out that he was not able to join us. So I want to take this opportunity to thank the Friends for their participation and for their financial support of this program. Please note that out on the registration desk, there's information about the, the Friends of the Law Library of Congress and a membership application in the Friends. Please take note of that and please join. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Law Librarian of Congress, Ms. Roberta Schaefer. Thank you, Leon, and let me thank all of you for coming today to join us to kick off the uh, week's buildup to uh, International Human Rights Day which will be next Thursday. And we will have an event next Thursday, and it is explained in the flyer that accompanies your program brochure. So we hope that you will join us again in one week, and in the meantime, have many opportunities to see much of the progress in human rights that is occurring, we hope, in the world today. Today, we are gathered to celebrate the Geneva Conventions. And as we think back, the Law Library of Congress was founded in 1832, and then I believe in 1864, a conference was held that was the beginning of the Geneva Convention and has led to a total of four conventions, and I believe it is as of today, three protocols, the most recent of which has been um, enacted or promulgated, I believe, in 2005. I'm saying I believe because even though I am a law librarian, I didn't go back and do all of my research as I should have before being before you today. But I hope that the Geneva Conventions are so much a part of global humanity's consciousness that we are aware of the milestones of the convention in everything that we do. And to prove that point, I did do a little bit of research on October 18th, there were over 300 stories in 19 languages for which the Geneva Convention, Conventions, was a key term. In the world today, in 37 countries, the Geneva Conventions are a part of the gymnasium, lycée, or high school curricula. And ironically enough, last week in the Washington Post, there was a cartoon, and not a political cartoon, but a cartoon on the funny pages that had to do with the Geneva Conventions. Not to imply at all that there's anything funny about the Geneva Conventions, but just to point out, I believe, that there is a social consciousness about the, the humanitarian aspects of the conventions that has even permeated the humor of our society, and I celebrate that. Maybe not the fact that it was um, an issue of, of humor. So today, we're taking stock, and we have gathered a very distinguished panel for those purposes. But before we do that, I would like to introduce Mr. Francis of the American Red Cross, who will give us a little bit of the connection, and it is a huge and admirable connection, that our partner organization, the Red Cross, has had with the Geneva Conventions. Mr. Francis.
Thank you, Roberta. My name is Susie DeFrancis, and thank you all for coming and for your interest in the Geneva Conventions. The American Red Cross is very pleased uh, to be co-sponsoring this event today with the Law Library of Congress, and what a magnificent and beautiful setting for this revered institution. Most of you know the Red Cross for the work we do collecting blood or providing comfort and shelter to victims of disaster. But the Red Cross also has other important aspects to our mission. We are chartered by Congress to act as a means of communication between the people of the United States and the armed forces. And we do that every day by delivering emergency messages to service members overseas. We do it 475 times each day, uh, messages from their family that need to be delivered. We are an institution that was actually born on the battlefield. When our founder, Clara Barton, cared for the wounded at the first battle of Bull Run during the Civil War. Clara believed that even wars have limits, and she was a strong advocate for her cause. It is largely due to Clara Barton's persistence that the United States ratified the Geneva Conventions in 1882. Today, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Network provide humanitarian assistance in conflict zones around the world. We work to reduce human suffering at precisely those moments when humanity may appear at its worst. To do this work, the Red Cross relies heavily on the Geneva Conventions. The conventions ensure that humanitarian actors can provide medical care and other basic services during armed conflicts. They also enshrine the basic principles that wounded soldiers should be cared for, captured soldiers should be treated humanely, and civilians should be spared. You may know that the Red Cross holds a particular place in the Geneva Conventions. The first Geneva Convention of 1864 created the Red Cross emblem and gave it protective value. They actually took the white cross on the red background from the Swiss flag and turned it into the red cross on the white flag, on uh, the white background for our emblem. Furthermore, because of the conventions, the red cross is charged with promoting and educating others about their importance. And we do that through a number of programs we host for the public and especially for secondary school children to learn about the conventions. So at the American Red Cross, we are extremely proud of our long history connected to the Geneva Conventions. And on a personal note, as a mother of an active duty Marine, I'm very interested in hearing from our panel today about how the protections offered by the Geneva Conventions are working today. We are also very pleased, coming up next, uh, to have remarks from the United Nations Ambassador, Susan Rice, who, as you know, is based in New York, but was able to send in videotaped remarks, which are really excellent, for today's event honoring the 60th anniversary of the signing of the conventions. And then after the video, Lucy Brown, also from the American Red Cross, will introduce our panelists. Enjoy the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this commemoration marking the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Geneva Conventions. And what two better organizations to join with in marking this milestone, the American Red Cross and the Law Library of Congress. I want to begin by saying as simply as possible, the United States will support and advance international humanitarian law, both as a matter of national policy and as a basic precept for the entire international community. We embrace the Geneva Conventions because it is the right thing to do. We embrace them because hard experience has taught us that we're safer and stronger when we do. And we embrace them because we honor the legal obligations we undertake. When I look back on the framers of the conventions, I see them first and foremost as pragmatists. They had just been through the most terrible war in all of human history. They'd seen extermination camps, mass rape, slave labor, and the execution of POWs. They knew the full horror of what war can bring about, and they had no illusions that war itself could be abolished. 
On the contrary, they saw the potential in those early days of the Cold War of a conflict even more destructive than the one they had just endured. They believed that before the next war was fought, the world urgently needed a set of rules to spare civilians from its devastation. They understood that more than ever before in history, we needed the discipline of such a code to wage war without losing our humanity. Many wars have indeed been fought since 1949. The Geneva Conventions have obviously not prevented the many tragedies and atrocities those wars have wrought. But the existence of the Geneva Convention rules has often stayed the hand of warring parties and saved innocent lives. The code of conduct they established has brought humane treatment and due care to prisoners of war. It spurred the design of military technologies so as to avoid human suffering. And it has helped us to mobilize pressure against those who violate international humanitarian law. In recent years, some have called the Geneva Conventions outdated as we face an enemy that is loyal to no state, that hides among civilians, and that routinely violates the laws our own forces are obliged to uphold. However, for all the enormity of Al-Qaeda's deadly ambitions, the challenge we face today has its own unfortunate tradition. The framers of the conventions were perfectly familiar with terrorism, albeit of a different sort. If anything, the conflict we are waging today in Afghanistan and the struggle against violent extremists and terrorists more broadly make the Geneva Conventions even more relevant and important. This conflict is not about winning territory, but about winning the confidence and respect of a population. That requires distinguishing civilians from combatants and protecting them from violence. As the commander of our forces in Afghanistan has said, while civilian protection is a legal and moral issue, it is also an overarching operational issue. A clear-eyed recognition that loss of popular support will be decisive to either side in this struggle. Our enemies may reject the values embodied in the Geneva Conventions, but that is just the point. Our insistence on distinguishing civilians from combatants is what distinguishes us from our enemies. So does the rejection of torture and cruelty. These are values from which our men and women in uniform draw strength and pride, and they help define what we stand for as a nation. And we are well served by our military lawyers who ensure that we live up to these rules every day, drawing on fundamental values and fortitude that go all the way back to 1775. As Senator McCain so rightly said when he challenged Congress to reject torture, this is not about who our enemies are. It is about who we are. The rules we embrace create a playing field on which those who take hostages or send truck bombs into apartment buildings or rockets into civilian neighborhoods have no legitimacy. They favor the way we and other democratic countries are already pledged to fight, not the way our enemies fight. They are morally right in and of themselves, but they also give us a great advantage. That's why President Obama rejects the false choice between our security and our values. It's why in his first week in office, he signed executive orders to close the Guantanamo Bay detention facility, to end without question the use of torture, and to ensure America's compliance with the Geneva Conventions. We also deeply value our continuing confidential dialogue with the International Committee of the Red Cross on and off the battlefield, and we welcome its advice on how we can do better. By taking these steps, we're in a stronger position to challenge other nations and groups to uphold international humanitarian law and to marshal opposition to those who do not. We're also in a better position to support the extraordinarily important work of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement around the world, including its support for and protection of civilians in crisis zones like Darfur and Sri Lanka. Finally, we're also better able to support the indispensable work of the American Red Cross, which introduces concepts of international humanitarian law 
through its Exploring Humanitarian Law program to schools and universities around the United States and in 40 countries worldwide. Our actions are an example to the youth of America that we're prepared to honor the principles of the Geneva Conventions. In closing, I want to thank the American Red Cross for the invaluable work you do every day in disaster and danger zones in the United States and around the world. And I want to thank the Law Library of Congress for promoting dialogue and scholarship on these very important issues. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, it's nice to be able to, to follow such inspiring remarks. I'm Lucy Brown from the American Red Cross, and I'm here to briefly introduce our panelists, and later I'll be also um, moderating our discussion. We are expecting Congressman Thomas Rooney to join us. Uh, he has a vote right now, and he will be coming as soon as he's able. Um, all of our panelists' bios can be found in your program uh, if you want to refer to them later. And each one is going to be speaking for 10 minutes on a topic of his choosing. And when, when that's finished, um, I will open the floor up for, for questions and answers. So I'm going to start by introducing the, uh, the two gentlemen that sit before us now. The first one, uh, Mr. W. Hayes Parks, insists on being called Hayes, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't start that way. So I have to say, so Hayes is a, a law of war expert of international statue, stature. He's, um, among many other things in his career, he was the special assistant to the Judge Advocate General of the Army for Law of War Matters from 1979 to 2003. He's currently revising the Department of Defense Law of War Manual. But importantly, perhaps to our discussion today, in the 1960s, he served as an infantry officer and prosecuting attorney for the 1st Marines Division in Vietnam. And today in his remarks, he's going to, uh, I think, take us back a little bit to that experience and talk about how the enforcement of the Geneva Conventions has changed since the time of the infamous um, My Lai Massacre. Brigadier General Patrick Finnegan, and, and by the way, Hayes is immediately to my left, and the general you probably can recognize uh, by his outfit. Um, <laughs> Brigadier General Patrick <laughs> Finnegan is fresh from an exciting uh, week at West Point, and so we're very glad that he could uh, be here with us today. Um, if we had a, a, a less distinguished panel, I would say that we've saved the best for last, but I'm actually not sure who's gonna go last today. Um, the General Finnegan uh, was confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2005 as the 17th Dean of the Academic Board of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He's an accomplished lawyer and a passionate educator. He's committed to upholding the standards of the Geneva Conventions and ensuring that if he has anything to say about it, everyone else will too. So today he will, uh, his marks will touch on torture and what the military teaches about the Geneva Conventions. So I'm going to ask Hayes to speak first. Well, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, listening to Ambassador Rice, I said, she took my outline and stole it from me <laughs> because uh, it was very much the kind of things that I had laid out. Uh, we were asked to answer four questions in 10 minutes or less. Uh, the first two are, have the Geneva Conventions worked and what significance have they played in history? I intend to answer them as Ambassador Rice did from the perspective of what I, <clears throat> as someone who's been with the military or in the Department of Defense for 40 some odd years now, has seen what we expect of our public, of our political leaders, and most importantly, of our military. As Lucy said, I was going to talk a little bit about the changes that occurred between 1971 and 2001. Uh, these were prompted by the Vietnam experience. Uh, we learned the hard way, the My Lai Massacre of March 16th, 1968, when an army platoon went into a village, rounded up all the civilians, and executed them. No excuse for it. It was plain murder. And if anyone ever asked me about, well, do the Geneva Conventions work, I always ask, what did we gain militarily from the My Lai Massacre? Absolutely nothing. 
and it's the kind of point I've repeated over and over and over again through the years. Uh, what happened at My Lai was not the representative of the way the United States military fought in that conflict. It is not the way the United States military has fought in conflict since that time. All of that, of course, is totally irrelevant. It did happen. We'd like to have a zero defects society. We do not want those kinds of things to happen because, again, uh, and Ambassador Rice is quoting General McChrystal, it gains us nothing, it hurts us an awful lot. Uh, after the disclosure of the Milai massacre and the prosecution of First Lieutenant Kelly, uh, there were several things happening. Most of them actually began down at the Army Jack School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I was in the graduate course there in 1972, just as the Cali case was up on appeal, and a lot of people were asking, well, is that really the way it was in Vietnam? And I said, no, it wasn't. And we had, I would say, six of us who had combat arms experience in Vietnam, and we had another uh, probably uh, 20 or so who had judge advocate experience there. And there was a sort of a collective thought that we can make this system better. And there were some other things going on simultaneously. And as a result, in 1974, uh, the, the first Department of Defense Law of War program directive was promulgated. A second pro protocol, or I'm sorry, directive that was promulgated at the same time required the legal review of all new weapons and ammunition to be used within the Department of Defense. Each of those, has, those programs has grown and grown and now basically are considered to be the best around the world. We, ours was actually one of the weapons review program was actually one of the first anywhere in the world, even before a legal requirement took place in the 1977 additional protocol one. There's been an increased judge advocate role. In Vietnam, judge advocates perform military justice matters, claims, legal assistance, and that was pretty much it. Uh, maybe some instruction on the law of war or rules of engagement, and it wasn't always the best, as actually the investigators of My Lai uh, determined. But what has happened since then is judge advocates have found we have a role here. We are here to help the commander, and the commanders do want our help to assist them in performing their jobs within the law. It was a bit of a challenge to begin with because everyone thought, here comes the lawyer. The only thing lawyers know is one word, one, one syllable called no. And they found that's not to be the case. In fact, we always tell our best lawyers, if you say no, you're not doing your job. What you need to say is, you probably can't do it or you shouldn't do it that way, but let me help you a way to do it within the law. And our commanders now don't make jokes about lawyers quite as much as they used to. Uh, they at least make now make them through your face rather than behind your back. But what they do is insist that the lawyer join them uh, when they deploy someplace. Have the Geneva Conventions worked? Yes, in Grenada in 1983, and Panama in 1989, and Operation Desert Storm, the liberation of Kuwait in 1991. All yes. Even in Operations Enduring Freedom, the our, when our forces went into Afghanistan in 2001 and in Iraqi freedom, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, yes. Now, the fact that we have one-tenth of one percent, meaning saying that it didn't work, tells you that, yes, we do have people who occasionally s step over the line, as happened in Vietnam. It was my experience to prosecute Marines for murder of civilians. It's a very unfortunate thing to have to do, but it's also a necessary thing because of another reason. Militaries insist upon a disciplined force. It's a more effective fighting force and we won't tolerate that type of activity. The people who have committed those type of offenses in Iraq and Afghanistan have also been prosecuted by judge advocates. So the Geneva Conver uh, Conventions have worked when they've been properly applied. What significance have they played in history? A very significant impact, both when applied properly and improperly. There has been a double standard, I will say that. In North Vietnam, over a period of nine years, the United States mil uh, military personnel and civilians were systematically tortured and abused and, and kept under the worst conditions in the world. Now, if I'm a fighting man on the, on the front talking to my soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines and say, we're gonna follow the Geneva Conventions, if someone says, well, they're not doing it, my answer is, we're not working for them. 
we're working for our government, for our nation, and what our nation expects of us. So the fact that the other side does something they shouldn't do or that's a violation of Geneva Conventions really is not germane to what we expect of our own warriors. Uh, <clears throat> I, I can say that certainly if we do abuse the enemy, it gives the enemy all the more moral standing to abuse the people that they capture who are U.S. and allied uh, civilians and military personnel. Finally, when we had the disclosure of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal during the Iraq conflict, uh, nothing knocked us off our moral pedestal more, in my opinion, than that particular disclosure. It should not have happened. It was inexcusable. In my personal opinion, the commanding general should have been prosecuted rather than merely, merely given Article 15 non-judicial punishment. Unfortunately, that did not occur. We will spend a very long time at least two decades, in my opinion, building back the role that we always have felt, uh, felt we had and, and the standing we felt we had around the world as the leading proponent for the law of war and it, its adherence to it. Now, what changes do we need post 9-1-1 to the Geneva Conventions? In my opinion, I don't think we need any. They do work. I always ask someone, well, we need to have another conference. What is it you want done? Because quite frankly, if you read the Geneva Conventions properly and if you follow them, they work fine. They have worked fine for some time. I think the main problem after the September 11, 2001 was that there was a significant uh, ignorance of the Geneva Conventions at the national level. There was contempt for them in some cases. Uh, this was not a matter of the military saying they knocked down the Twin Towers, let's go out and ignore the Geneva Conventions. It came from other levels. A great deal of skepticism. It did not occur within the military ranks. There were things within the Geneva Conventions that the people who were criticizing them did not even understand. There is a 800-year-old tradition of something called right authority. It means that only the leadership of a nation has the right to send people to war, that private citizens do not have the right to go out and wage war, and private citizens who do that without right authority, without government authority, are not entitled to prisoner of war status. Unfortunately, even in the explanations often given about the Geneva Conventions, that point was completely missed, yet it's clearly in Article 4A, Paragraph 2. Uh, so the idea was we just won't give them anything. We have another tradition, which we've been putting into effect since the Vietnam War, of even if a person is not entitled to prisoner of war status, we will provide them prisoner of war protections. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is it's the right things to do, thing to do. But second, it's also the easiest way to do things. The US Army knows how to run a prisoner of war camp. Uh, in many operations we've carried out since Vietnam, including some such as uh, in Grenada uh, and in Panama and uh, in Somalia, we may not have technically been taking prisoners of war. But when we did capture people, this was also true in Haiti, we simply changed the sign to detainee facility instead of prisoner of war camp, and the camp continued to function as it should run, uh, function as a prisoner of war camp, simply because the people are already trained and know how to do this. So the idea that we would just throw the, throw the baby out with the bathwater that took effect uh, after 9-1-1 was a very serious mistake. The last question is, what is at stake when human standards are ignored? I don't believe it's a failure of the Geneva Conventions. I think it's a failure of how the US military fights and how our nation expects us to fight, as I've suggested earlier. It's the loss of moral high ground, as I've also said. People do look up to us. If you look at the popularity, and I'll say this before the congressman gets here, if you look at the popularity of various groups within the United States, the military ranks higher than congressmen, than lawyers, I resemble that remark, uh, and many other professionals. So that speaks well, speaks volumes for what people do expect of our military when we go to war. And as I've said before, we must fight the way we fight following the Geneva Conventions regardless of how the other side fights. Thank you very much.
Lucy told me I now have an hour. <laughs> well, I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be asked to be a part of this panel, particularly because of its other members. Congressman Tom Rooney, who's not here yet, is a friend of mine. We used to teach together in the Department of Law at West Point, and I'm happy to see him as a member of Congress. In Hayes Parks, uh, as a longtime friend and colleague, and as many people who've been involved in this business for years do, I consider him a mentor and an icon, really, in international humanitarian law. He's been a leader in the Department of Defense and Department of the Army for decades. I'm not going to tell him how old you are, Hayes. <laughs> but he's been doing this for, for a number of years. And, and I've looked to him for advice. And many other people throughout the Department of Defense have done the same for years. And so I, I'm honored just to be a part of a panel with Hayes Parks. This is the Geneva Convention's turn 60, We're talking about the 49 Convention. So it's good for me because the Convention's turn 60 this year, and so do I. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about what the military currently teaches about international humanitarian law, the law of war. And you're going to hear echoes of what Hayes said and what the ambassador said in my comments as well. But I think that's probably worthwhile to hear from slightly different perspectives, some very similar points. I'm really going to focus my remarks more on an issue that is certainly related to the conventions and has been more contemporary uh, since 9-11, and that is the issue of torture, which is forbidden by the Geneva Conventions as well as other international treaties but we've struggled with that as well. We do teach the Geneva Conventions throughout the military. The common articles of the conventions require you to teach to your soldiers, to your airmen, to your Marines, what the conventions say. We do that. We do that routinely. Uh, we did it before 9-11. We do it routinely now. We do it before soldiers deploy. We have classes even while they're overseas. Uh, before we sent the first troops to Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I was on the green ramp at Fort Bragg giving last minute classes, just reminding them of what the rules of engagement were and how they were to treat people. We do that all the time now. We do it because we're required to, certainly by the conventions, but we do it more because that's how we want to conduct ourselves. That's how we want military operations to be conducted, for many of the reasons that Hayes stated, but also for the reasons that Ambassador Rice stated. This is who we are as a nation. This is who we represent as soldiers, who we represent as a country. You do have people who ask, and I'll tell you, you have occasionally cadets who ask and soldiers who ask, why should we follow the law? Here you have the most horrible thing known to mankind, war, where you are killing people and breaking things. What kind of rules do you have? I mean, you think about Shakespeare, said all's fair in love and war. Think about Cicero from Roman days, who said when the fighting starts, which now translated as when the guns begin, although he didn't have guns back then, when the guns begin, the laws fall silent. We don't believe that. We believe that there is a reason to bring some order to this most horrible of human endeavors. We want, we don't want terrible hostilities to be conducted. We want, we're, we're fighting for a purpose, and that purpose is ultimately peace. If you, if you wage war in terrible way, in terrible methods, you will never have a just peace. And it's also for us, who we are. We're a nation that professes to, and I hope we do, believe in the rule of law. We say that we want democracy of some sort, freedom, liberty for other nations around the world. That's why we are in Afghanistan now. That's why we say we went to Iraq, not to conquer anyone, not to do something like that, but to help other people be free and to some extent emulate what we have 
respect for the rule of law. And it is law. It's a law that's binding on us. You know, the Geneva Conventions is the most ratified treaty in the history of the world. In fact, I, to my knowledge, it's the only treaty that has been ratified by every nation in the world. Even those that we would consider rogue nations, Libya, North Korea, and others, have ratified the Geneva Conventions. And we have as well. And that means something particularly for us because Article 6 of our Constitution says that ratified treaties are the law of the land, along with the Constitution. They become the supreme law of the land. So we adhere to those laws as we adhere to the principles that are in the Constitution. Are the conventions quaint, as they've been described, or outdated? I think you could probably point to a few minor provisions of some parts of the conventions and say, well, that's a little bit out of date. But the basic principles aren't coined at all. They are not outdated at all. The protection of victims of war, the protection of humanitarian ideals, they will never be quaint. And I want to talk specifically now about the one issue of torture that's been so much, not only in the news, but but discussed, described, uh, argued about. I'll give you my bottom line first. Torture is not legal, practical, effective, and it's wrong. I can conceive of no circumstances in which we should engage in torture, none. And I'll, I'll, as I've thought about this and talked about it with friends, I've really come up with seven reasons why we shouldn't torture. Some of them are practical, and others, you'll see, fall in other categories. First, despite what you see from Jack Bauer and in other circumstances, torture is ineffective. It does not work. You can look at appellate case law, you can look at academic studies, you can look at what has actually gone on in the world and you cannot find circumstances where torture actually works. So even if you thought, well, well, we'll skirt around this law and just do a little bit of torture light, it's not gonna work. What happens is you get confessions to everything. And Senator McCain is probably a great example. He was tortured in North Vietnam, and he confessed to all kinds of war crimes that he didn't commit, but he did it because he was tortured. I know it's always effective right when Kiefer Sutherland does it, and he does it eight or nine times a season, which if you think about it means in the course of 24 hours, one day he tortures eight people, and it always works, and it's always patriotic but it's neither. The second reason is, and I'm gonna gloss over a couple of these, it really gives you no actionable intelligence. You, can't, you don't get anything you can, can use from this, so why violate law and morality to, to do something to someone who really can't help you? Um, the third, which is related to that, particularly for directly military folks, is it is it promotes other battlefield misconduct. You can't ignore some rules and follow the others. You can't turn a blind eye to some of these Geneva Conventions and, and other treaties and then uh, expect your unit to be disciplined and to follow the law. And you can see examples of that throughout history, and My Lai is one of them. There are others. In the, in the current fight, there's a Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, an Army officer, a battalion commander who uh, engaged in torture and a mock assassination. And when that happened, his soldiers turned him in. His soldiers knew that it was wrong because they knew they didn't want to be a part of a unit like that. Another reason that I am absolutely against torture is it's counterproductive. 
even if you could prove that in one or two instances it worked to get you some information, which I haven't seen proved yet, but even if you could, in the long run, torture is counterproductive. The French found that in Algeria. The Israelis have found it over the years where they allowed moderate physical pressure and found that that didn't help them with terrorists. And in, in two of the examples, one of the examples that Hayes gave and in, in another one, hi Tom, how are you? In Abu Ghraib and in Guantanamo, we have not, we, we have suffered and will continue to suffer the results of those. Um, we've captured a number of young men who are potential suicide bombers, who are potential jihadists before they were able to do something and interviewed them. And many of them come from relatively well-to-do backgrounds. They're not living in, uh, in camps and have no future. We, but when we interviewed them, at, we asked them, why have you turned to jihad? Why, are you, why have you become a terrorist? Can you guess their main answer? Abu Ghraib, the pictures from Abu Ghraib. So even if you could show that in one instance you got one piece of information that was helpful, what we did in Abu Ghraib and what we did in the early days of Guantanamo is create more terrorists and make it much harder for us to ultimately win this fight. Certainly much harder to win the fights for hearts and minds for those moderate Islam whom we need to have on our side. The fifth reason that I'm opposed to torture is it erodes character. It erodes the character of the person doing the torturing, and it certainly erodes the character of the nation. And you can, you can talk to people who've been involved in this, unless they're complete sociopaths, it plagues them for the rest of their lives that they were involved in something like this. And now really to the, to the heart of why this is wrong. My sixth reason is it's unlawful. Every military code, every domestic criminal system, every international treaty regime that we have ratified, the Geneva Conventions among them, says torture is unlawful. If we're about the rule of law, if we are about following law, then we have to set the example in this area as well. And we have prosecuted people for this. There's, I guess, some debate, I'm not sure how valid a debate it is, about whether waterboarding is torture. We prosecuted military officers, United States military officers and soldiers after the Philippine insurrection because they waterboarded people, because we knew that it was torture. It's kind of hard to now say that it's not. When I talk to cadets and to military folks and officers, I tell them, again, to remind them about the lawfulness of what the Geneva Conventions are and the legal authority here. When you become an officer, when you become a soldier, you take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that Constitution, in Article 6, includes ratified treaties. So you're taking an oath to uphold the principles in those conventions. And the last reason that certainly echoes what Hayes and the Ambassador both said is it's wrong. Are you willing to risk your honor, your integrity, who you are as a person, who you are as an officer, who you are as a representative of the United States, the nation you represent for minimal or no gain? You think about public opinion and where we are these days, trying to convince those moderates in the Islamic world that we have the right way. Where's our international standing right now? And I want you to compare it 
to where we stood on the 12th of September, 2001. The headlines in the papers in France that day said, we are all Americans. That day and the next day, there were demonstrations on the streets of Tehran in favor of the United States of America. Where are we now? Uh, because we've engaged in some of these activities and because we've even debated them, we have lost some of the moral underpinnings of the war on terror. What do we look like? Hypocrites. We say we believe this, we say we believe in these humanitarian principles, I guess except when it's hard. This is, to me, what we're about, not only as an army, but what we're about as a nation. I mean, who do we see ourselves as? Who are we? If this was a Western movie, who would we be? Aren't we the good guys? Don't we think that? I hope we are. I hope that that's what we believe. We say that we're about establishing freedom and democracy and the rule of law. How can we be about freedom if we use or condone torture? Where we stand on this issue and on following the other principles of the Geneva Conventions defines our national values. To do the harder right, not on their level, not to become the people we're fighting, but to distinguish ourselves. I think you, you hear people say, but they're beheading folks on national television. They're disagreeing, they're di disregarding all these rules. And as Hayes says, that doesn't matter. I think it's pretty simple to profess your belief in principles and values and ethics when the path is easy. It's when times are tough, when the enemy is like this, when it's critical. That's when you find out what do you truly believe? Who are you at your core as a nation? You know, this is not something new to this country. In a prior war that we fought, I'm gonna read you a couple of extracts. American leaders believed it wasn't enough to win the war. They were fighting a very difficult war. They thought they had to also win in a way that was consistent with the values of their society, and they were fighting a horrible enemy. And there, not all Americans agreed with that principle because the enemy was so horrible. And not all Americans said we should treat people with humanity. They said the other side's not doing it. Why should we do that? But the American leadership at the time prevailed, even though American prisoners of war were being executed, even though soldiers were being captured and killed before they were even prisoners of war, even though civilians were being slaughtered, the American people, the American leaders said, that's not what we're about. That can't be what we're about. And they said, we will treat people with humanity and let the other side have no reason to complain that we're doing the things that they're doing. Do you know what war that was? That was the Revolutionary War. That was George Washington and the leaders of that war. So that's why this is a principle that this nation was founded on, that humanitarian ideals, humanitarian ideals, even when you're fighting a horrific war, are what this country's about. The, the principles that we believe in as a nation, what we stand for, are reflected in the Geneva Conventions, those international norms, and how we adhere to them. Thank you very much. That's a hard act to follow. Um, we're very happy that Congressman Thomas Rooney has been able to join us. Um, 
walk across the lawn and uh, be part of our afternoon program. Uh, the congressman represents Florida's 16th congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives where he serves on the House Armed Services Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Important for our discussion today, though, is he is also a former military lawyer who served in the Army JAG, or Judge Advocate General Corps, for over four years. And he has taught, as General Finnegan mentioned, um, at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So his remarks today will address the changing face of modern warfare. And when Congressman Rooney is finished, we will um, open, we'll, we'll all sit down and we'll open the floor up for question and answer. Congressman. Thank you very much and, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege and, and honor to be here. Um, you know, I, I'm a new congressman. I've only been in Congress for about a year, and it wasn't so long ago that I used to work for this guy right here up at West Point in what, and I'm not ashamed to say, was the greatest job I know I'll ever have, even better than being a congressman. Please, if there's reporters in the room, don't write that down. I don't want to get in trouble. But when you walk the walls, uh, walk the halls and corridors and, and uh, uh, live amongst the cadets, um, having not gone to West Point, um, you know, you truly understand uh, that they are called the best of the best for a reason. And when they have leadership and they have instruction, they have guidance from people like General Finnegan, um, you can see why. Uh, these are the guys and gals that are going to be leading our troops for the future, and, and I think that we're well served. There, there's also a great staff there, and in fact, not too long ago, uh, when you're running for politics especially, and I. You know, I'm a Republican, and there's another congressman that also worked for General Finnegan named Patrick Murphy from Philadelphia, who's a Democrat. And uh, so this guy has got a pretty good uh, track record of inspiring his uh, employees to do, uh, go on and try to do bigger and better things. And, and um, in fact, there's, I don't know if you know this, but there was another captain that was very seriously considering running for Congress up in Massachusetts. Uh, but he didn't feel like he could raise the money, and unfortunately, that's a big part of the game, as you probably well know nowadays. But anyway, um, one of the things that y you, you struggle with as a, as a former uh, Army officer and as somebody who's getting involved in politics and as somebody who listens to both sides and kind of the popu popular culture um, on both sides of ideologies and um, things is to try to gauge who you really are at your core, to sometimes buck your party trend and, and other times try to lead by example or lead by convincing people that you might not necessarily agree with that you're wrong and this is why you're wrong or this is why I disagree. Uh, one of those things that General Finnegan was talking about in my campaign came up uh, and that dealt with torture. And that's not really what I want to address, and I'm not going to speak long because I cannot follow that act, and I just wanted to say that, you know, it, it is important that, that it's recognized that torture, for all of the reasons that General Finnegan discussed, is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. I think that if you listen to the people that actually served in the military, like Senator McCain and uh, uh, Senator Graham and some of those of us on in the House, um, you know, we believe that it is who we are as Americans who built these great buildings and gave us the treasures that we have in this country because of the values and the character that General Finnegan spoke of. That we are Americans goes beyond just a mass of land and uh, great men that came before us and women. Uh, it goes to the, the, the spirit, that revolutionary spirit um, that General Washington um, reminded of so long ago. And that is that we are a, a, a people that believes not only in the rule of law, but in uh, basically natural law and, and humanitarian law. And that's what's been later codified in the Geneva Conventions. So I think that when people seem surprised about my stance on torture or um, because I'm a Republican or uh, some of the things that I've said about where our military should move forward or the, the fact that just recently uh, I support the president and what he's trying to do now in Afghanistan, even though some people on my side of the aisle, although some people on his side of the aisle too aren't too happy either, but 
It's, it's funny, it, just as an aside, it was a long time where I think I clicked to Fox, MSNBC, and CNN after a speech, and they were all, all bad-mouthing the president, <laughs> equally, for different reasons, but, um, but it, it's difficult. As the commander-in-chief, uh, he, he didn't sound like a speech that he wanted to give, but who could blame him? Nobody wants to give a speech that's going to commit um, soldiers to war and potentially put them in harm's way. And, and, uh, and certainly, Patrick Murphy and myself sent a letter to the Washington Post supporting the president, and hopefully uh, we can do what we need to do. But anyway, I just want to raise one issue that I'm not sure if it's even been raised, but it's something that you know I, I talked or emailed uh, over the course of my campaign and some of the things that I struggle with, not only with General Finnegan, but other people that I served with in the Army. And that deals with uh, not necessarily just laws of war, but rules of engagement and, and, and the situation that our soldiers are more in, increasingly uh, put into, and that's this situation where you have the enemy that almost uses the Geneva Convention as their main weapon against us. In, in, in that, I mean, they know that we, for the most part, are going to try to adhere to a code of conduct and the laws of war uh, that, that are codified in the Geneva Conventions, the subsequent protocols, and, um, and general laws of war uh, generally. But how do you fight, how do you combat an enemy that disregards those rules and disregard those laws strictly from the, pur from the purpose that they know that it's going to put us in the compromising position? If I take this shot, am I going to go to Leavenworth for the rest of my life? And how long has that been in our American soldier psyche that what they're about to do might get them court-martialed? Um, I agree with General Finnegan. I don't think it's necessarily a new phenomenon, but I think that this counterinsurgency type warfare versus conventional warfare where we have tanks or soldiers lining up six feet across from each other and just saying fire, those days are gone. Um, they may come back. I don't know necessarily if we should abandon that kind of training altogether, but this is the kind of enemy that we're faced with now. And it makes it very difficult. And I think that it's something I just want to raise the point before I sit down that uh, the work that the Red Cross has done, uh, the purpose of the Geneva Conventions in my mind, and the subsequent protocols, the laws of war, um, uh, I think need to recognize more than they have that the enemy is doing what they're doing for a specific purpose. And they're as accountable under the Geneva Conventions as the signatories of the Geneva Convention are for violating the laws of war. Uh, I think traditionally, if you did not wear a uniform, fight under a common flag, doing things like using women and children as shields and the like, you would lose your protections under the Geneva Convention as, with regard to prisoner of war status. I know subsequent uh, court hearings have kind of questioned that notion, but um, I don't think that it should ever be lost, the fact that, that they, the enemy, are using these rules that we live and, and work by uh, as their major weapon against us, and, and that's a very difficult tool. And it's one, believe me, I'm as emotional as, as anybody, and, and listening to General Finnegan time and time again reinforces who I want to be as a person and as a man. But there are times when you hear the stories of Haditha and you hear the stories of, um, like in the book, Lone Survivor in, in Afghanistan, or just recently with the SEALs and the, the prisoner, that um, uh, the allegations that have been made. And it goes all the way back to Mogadishu. And um, well, it goes way before that. But uh, in, modern, in the, these modern type of conflicts, when you see the enemy purposely putting more people in harm's way, purposely putting non-combatants in a situation where they could get killed because they know the effect that that's going to have not only on uh, our cause but on the international community. Um, it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to be a judge advocate in the United States Army or any branch right now because of these questions. But in the end, I think that we have to stand up as Americans and we have to stand up as Army officers uh, and do the right thing uh, when we're faced with these conflicts, regardless of what the enemy is going to do, and regardless of how difficult the enemy is making it on us. But I just, 
I, 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 I want to close by just saying I hope that those of you out there recognize, and the, I know the Red Cross recognizes, that the enemy that we face uses the Geneva Conventions or violating the Geneva Conventions as their main weapon, and that makes it very difficult, and that should never be forgotten. So thank you very much. All the best. Um, I think it's listening to our, to our three speakers today. It was very clear to me that uh, there was a connection between what they said and what Ambassador Rice's uh, remarks referred to earlier. And I want to just quote, we are well served by our military lawyers who ensure that we live up to these fundamental values, speaking of the Geneva Conventions, every day. And it's, it's, it's actually a coincidence, but um, all three of our speakers have served as military lawyers. And I think that's a pretty great testament um, to, to, to law and the military. And even if lawyers um, aren't held uh, always in high regard, and I'm one myself, I, I think we can be very proud of, of, the, of the, the military and its, and its uh, upholding of our, of our laws. So now you've, you've, heard, um, you've heard that the Geneva Conventions represent what we want to be um, as Americans. And you've heard um, Congressman Rooney just say that it can be very difficult at times. But we'd like to open the floor up and get your uh, questions, your thoughts. So please, we have microphones on both sides. And if you would just raise your hand, someone will bring you a microphone, and you can ask a question. Hi. I'm a retired Red Cross uh, employee, and I was involved with the International Committee of the Red Cross, and to speak specifically to um, Congressman Rooney's point, when um, Warrant Officer Duran was held in Somalia, uh, one of the things the ICRC communicated was, because they had worked very closely with the Somalis, and the Somalis that captured the Americans understood the value of the Geneva Conventions and fair treatment. That was very key in protecting Warren Officer Durand and the other military people. So it does work, not every time, but I wanted to communicate that, that it's, it's an important um, thing that we, uh, we continue to promote. I agree. I think that was the best part of that was the that was the best part of that story was that you know that human character that we talked about uh, prevailed in that case and and that's as was said what I think we aspire to to be more of the norm. <coughs> I also want to just echo something you said that you know there's just a lot of uh, debate going on up here on Capitol Hill right now about the trials of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others in New York versus the military tribunal. My <clears throat> personal problem with New York is simply from the standpoint is I kind of take offense that it's, and this is probably overreactionary, that, that the powers that be don't think that the military can do a, a good enough job. And I, I just take it personally in that way. And I'm sure that's not the real reason, but I just throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have another question, comment? Uh, yes, I'd like to have uh, someone address the circumstances under which the first Geneva Convention took place in what, what, 1864 was it? I wasn't there, but I can answer yeah. that. <laughs> um, the story goes back to the book that actually was published by Henry Dunant, uh, the Battle of so on the Battle of Soporino, Souvenir of Soporino, uh, and they basically uh, Dunant went uh, to this battle uh, and uh, witnessed the fact that a number of wounded soldiers were laying around the battlefield, while civilians came around and scavenged them, took their jewelry, took their boots, and things like that. There was no medical treatment for them, and they eventually would just simply die of their wounds. And uh, he thought there was a better way to do things. And uh, he had some meetings in Geneva, and ultimately uh, the first Geneva Convention came of that. Now, there's a reason for that. Uh, if you're going to start getting governments to agree to things going on on the battlefield, take the easiest approach first. 
and the easiest approach is there is a common interest of all nations of having their wounded survive the battle and return home. Uh, and so as a result, the first Geneva Convention dealt with wounded and sick on the battlefield as well as the medical personnel taking care of them. So that was the really, that was the first Geneva Convention. And uh, it, it sort of, it was the one that broke the code and got things going. Okay, what about another question? Do we have something? We have a question down here in front. when we talk about the, the, uh, the impact of not adhering to the Geneva Conventions, and I think all the speakers addressed to that, but what is the impact when the punishment does not fit the crime, or at least there is a perception that the crime is um, disproportionate to the punishment ultimately levied? I think it's unfortunate because in any other type of military discipline, when, when a young trooper goes astray, the rest of his unit learns what happens to him. In fact, we used to publish the orders. Uh, it, it's a deterrent to other troops. Um, Lieutenant Kelly was convicted of, I think, over 100 acts, counts of murder and uh, was given a very moderate sentence. But ultimately, within days, President Nixon said he would personally review the case and the prosecuting attorney in that case, Captain Almir McDaniel, spoke up publicly and said the president has no business getting into this. Uh, Lieutenant Calley was put on house arrest while his case was appealed, including letting his girlfriend come over and spend as much time with him as she liked. And ultimately, um, his, ser his uh, sentence was reduced. Um, so he really never went to Fort Leavenworth to serve. I guess he did go to Fort Leavenworth briefly, but it was not for any amount of time. And considering all that happened on that day, that's, that's pretty pathetic. Um, now, let me give you the other side of it. I think the congressman probably would have a greater appreciation for this than almost anyone else in the room. Um, whereas people like myself who had served in Vietnam and who prosecuted cases like that said, go after this guy, slam him. Two things happened on the way to trial of many of these cases. Many... Uh, People, I'm sure, of feeling that they were doing the right thing, protested prosecuting this poor officer just because he happened to kill a couple hundred civilians. Because after all, you go to war to kill people, right? And uh, in fact, the American Legion uh, group in, in, in Columbus, Georgia, put out a 45 RPM. Those of you who are not old enough to know, that's the tiny little records. Uh, played to the battle hymn of the Republic, I will not sing it for you, uh, that started off, my name is Rusty Calley, I'm the hero of the land. So you kind of get the drift that there was this pressure from some on the opposite side to let him go, that uh, he just was killing these kinds of folks. Uh, and that was the kind of pressure that I think that uh, caused President Nixon to speak up. So it's, it's very unfortunate, you, and you've seen that, the Haditha cases. Uh, I can't talk about them because I was uh, an expert witness in the cases and the one against the commanding officer might be retried, so I've, I've got to stay away from it. But nonetheless, you had the same type of outcry. Those who felt that if, there, if a crime had been committed, it should be prosecuted. And those who felt, eh, you know, it's, it's war, that's what it's all about. So it's very important to, to make that kind of, strike that kind of balance. In the Abu Ghraib case, I had, uh, I had occasion to read the 12 formal investigations into that matter twice, because one of my jobs was to take all the correspondence from the International Committee of the Red Cross up to committees of the House and Senate and let them read them. One of the real exception, because the Red Cross correspondence is confidential, uh, to get a better sense of what had happened. And I, I did really feel that uh, there was a case there that should have been prosecuted for a lot of reasons. One is to let the world know that we will not tolerate this, even if the person is a Brigadier General. No offense, Pat. Uh, 
uh, that we, and, and that's the kind of thing that is not the way we act, and we do believe in prosecuting people. So I think there is a real, two things. I mean, first, is the person guilty of these offenses? Second, to show the world that we will not turn a blind eye to these offenses. And third, to let our own military know that this is not the type of conduct that we accept. Can I add something there? there there's no set of laws that's perfect or certainly perfectly enforced. You can choose any, the Ten Commandments, traffic laws, uh, and the Geneva Conventions, certainly. Every, every country that signs up to them agrees that they will prosecute offenders. I think we do that. We, we take steps to doing it. Are the, are the trials perfect? Are the results perfect? Not at all. But I think we're striving to do what we should do by identifying those cases where people are so far out of bounds, Milai, Haditha, that we prosecute. And, and it's like any prosecution, there are other factors that are involved. The sentence may not be what you would hope for or expect, but we take the steps that we should take when, when people violate these laws. It, it, let me add one more thing to that, because this, this is also important. It's a phenomenon that happens in every single nation when they do take people to trial. You'll find in most of these cases, they serve a fraction of the sentence. Uh, I, I convicted one Marine who was, in many ways, a real hero. Convicted him of five counts of premeditated murder over a two-day period. Uh, he, he got a mandatory life sentence. He served about three and a half years. And that, there were a number of factors there. One is defense counsel was terrible. He didn't do his job. And second, people just said, it's over, it's done. Vietnam is behind us, let's put this behind us. So that, I agree with uh, the Pat, that you have to take him to trial. You use the system as it should be used, but in the ultimate, at the end of the day, uh, there are these other factors that will play. the Geneva Conventions. Oh, there it goes. Um, primarily people without uniforms or whatever. My question for you is, can you hold people accountable to the Geneva Conventions if they're not signatories? And if they're not signatories, are they protected? And do we have any obligation to them? From what I understand, it, you are, you are, you can be held accountable even if you're not a signatory. And um, it's almost that the, the Geneva Conventions and sort of the the rules and laws that it conveys is almost like common law now with regard to fighting wars. And so, um, and, and I'll let the true experts weigh in on this, but my, you know, I, I don't want to leave the impression that conventional warfare is not going to be an option ever again. Certainly that's a fight that we have during our appropriation arguments all the time is so should we still buy tanks and big planes and things like that. But, um, but as of today, the, 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 the enemy that we face, um, by and large, is one that um, would not be considered a, uh, an enemy that represents a specific country or, or, or fights uh, under a common flag or, or those type of things. And so um, that's where a lot of our resources have gone. But, you know, do I think that they should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law for breaking the laws of war, absolutely. And do I think that they are? I don't think that they are as much as they should be. I, I think that if I think that if what they do is amplified more, and the way they fight amplified more, I think that it would get more international support for what we're trying to do. But I mean, that's I don't know how I can stand up here and scream at the top of my lungs to give you know look at what how bad they are. Uh, but uh, you know whether or not that gets covered or not is not something I can control. I, I'm sure our two other panelists have some thoughts about this topic that you may want to share. I can add a little bit. In fact, going back to the first question about the Geneva Conventions, almost simultaneously with the first Geneva Convention, uh, during uh, the U.S. Civil War, uh, there were questions here about the various private armies that were, in fact, fighting on one side or the other, Union or the Confederates. And Dr. Francis Lieber, who was a professor at Columbia, was asked the question, are these people entitled to prisoner of war status? 
And he made a very clear distinction that, again, as I mentioned in my remarks, goes back today over 800 years. If you have authority from a government to fight, uh, it's called right authority, that you are then considered to be a lawful combatant. There may be some additional criteria put in there, but nonetheless, you are. And the idea is that you do not want private citizens going out and fighting because that, in the long run, will endanger the overall civilian population. And he wrote, uh, the next document he wrote was in 1863 called U.S. Army General Orders Number 100, or the Lever Code, which again said this very same thing. He didn't say specifically who he was talking about, but you can look at it and say he understood John Mosby, who had, who led a group that was actually commissioned by the governor of uh, Virginia to fight, was regarded as a lawful combatant and had what we call the combatant's privilege. On the other hand, uh, a bunch of outlaws out in, in Kansas uh, of Quantrill were nothing but robbers who were taking advantage of the war. Those people would have been unprivileged belligerents and were subject to punishment for that. And this, this is exactly the way the Geneva Prisoner of War Convention is written. It establishes in there who is entitled to prisoner of war status and who is not. In Article 4A2, recognizing how we use resistance movements uh, against the Axis powers during World War II, recognized uh, in the 1949 convention, organized resistance movements of a state party to the conflict. There's your right authority, then meeting the four criteria, carrying your arms openly, wearing, wearing something that shows you're in the military, uh, following the command of someone who then ensures that you carry out your acts in accordance with the law of war. So there is a very clear distinction. Now, I'll tell you that from the standpoint of having run counterinsurgency operations in Vietnam, it doesn't make any difference to your soldiers and Marines. They're fighting guerrillas, and guerrillas can be lawful or they can be unlawful combatants. They can happen in an international armed conflict or in a uh, non-international armed conflict. The idea is to train them that just because someone is carrying out acts as a guerrilla does not mean that you have the right to shoot every civilian that you see or just because someone looks at you cross-eyed. And that's the key. This is the our, uh, rules for use of force or rules for, of engagement that both Congressman Rooney and, 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 and Pat have talked about here, that uh, you've got to, this is getting the folks trained on this. This is what our police officers do every day on the street. Just because one person killed four people in Washington State last week, murdered four police officers, did not give the police the right to go out and kill anybody that looked at them the wrong way. And that's the way our soldiers have to be trained too. It's a different way from an international armed conflict where the enemy is a uniformed enemy coming at you across a linear battlefield. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that we have to emphasize to them. Okay, we, we actually have uh, less than five minutes left in the program. I think that there is a question over here and maybe we could have a question and a short response. <coughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, I wondered, wondered if you would address the issue of torture and in particular uh, the treaty, I believe which was in 1987, the torture treaty, and how that is different than the Geneva Conventions. And the, this issue came up in Iraq, I believe, as to whether they applied to the uh, people who were being declared unlawful combatants or whatnot. Uh, how they relate together. Well, the Convention on Torture uh, is, prohibits torture and inhumane treatment. Uh, it really probably it doesn't differ much in its basic principles from the provisions of the conventions that, that prohibit torture and inhumane treatment as well. Uh, but it, it, there are some more specifics in that treaty. And it kind of goes to your question as well. Do the rules of the conventions and these treaties apply to these unlawful belligerents? Prisoner of war status probably doesn't for the reasons Hayes said. But other provisions of the conventions do apply. In, in Common Article Three, for example, and, and the, the requirement uh, under the, the Convention on Torture as well is that you treat all people humanely and you don't torture. We've signed up, we've ratified for that, ratified that, and so the Common Article Three provisions apply to anyone who's fighting us, whether they are wearing a uniform and have an insignia. And if you look at it, they're not very tough standards. It's basic humanitarian principles. You don't kill, you don't execute people without a trial. You don't torture people. 
it's, it's the kind of things you, you don't want any government to do to their own citizens, much less to somebody else. And so those provisions, those basic humanitarian provisions, apply to anyone whom we're fighting, and they certainly apply to the people whom we're, who we seize as detainees in Iraq or Afghanistan, whether they're terrorists, whether they're insurgents, whoever they are. We, we, those conventions are not about who they are, again, as we've said before, they're about who we are and what we do. Let me, let me just, I, just to echo that, I think that one of the, the key things that you, know, we, you learn when, on the first day of JAG school in Charlottesville, Virginia, is the reason why we hold ourselves to the highest standard is because regardless if we're gonna get that treatment in return, and that's the thing that people push back, well, they're just gonna chop our heads off if they take, it doesn't matter. You hold yourself to the highest standard with the expectation, however realistic or unrealistic, that if, you're, that if you or people are taken uh, prisoner, um, that they would receive the like, the, the like treatment. That, that is why we hold ourselves to that highest standard. Okay, now that we're really, um, we're really rolling, I'm going to um, have to, um, to close this so that you all can uh, leave on time. And I want to first thank our panelists who have uh, provided from their uh, experience such great insights. The challenges of upholding, uh, for operating uh, in situations as you mentioned, asymmetric warfare, they're calling it now, you know, upholding these standards. But um, then also, I think everybody here has said something about it's the right thing to do and we're better off if we pay attention to this. So thank you um, panelists, each one of you, and thank you um, audience for your intent listening. I didn't see anybody nodding off. <laughs> I saw everybody paying close attention and for your thoughtful questions. And on behalf of the um, American Red Cross and the Law Library of Congress, um, I wanna close and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.